Welcome to the NSCHBC EDGE podcast, leading the way in the business of medicine. Now here's your host, Terry Fletcher. Hello everyone and welcome to the NSCHBC EDGE podcast. I'm your host, Terry Fletcher. The EDGE podcast is brought to you today by the National Society of Certified Healthcare Business Consultants. Our goal is to discuss healthy business principles, have conversations on the business side of medicine, so that you and your practice can thrive and be profitable and successful for years to come. As many of you know, the NSCHBC is a proactive organization with over 300 members, including legacy members, that share their wealth of knowledge and expertise expertise with each other, whether it be in the legal field, the accounting field, the revenue cycle management field, business management field, value-based care, and more. For this episode, I'm welcome. I'm happy to welcome back fellow NSCHBC member, healthcare consultant, and who the industry calls the compliance guy himself, Sean Weiss. Sean has an extensive knowledge of the inner workings of the government agencies at both the federal and state level, including the Office of Specter General, Department of Justice, and the United States Attorney's Office. Sean represents the voice of healthcare providers, medical societies, and integrated health systems on key legislative issues with members of Congress and other government agencies and governmental agencies such as the Office of Specter General that often rely on Sean for guidance on interpreting complex Medicare guidelines, regulations, and statutes. Sean also primarily focuses on defense work on behalf of the physician, and Sean, we are happy to have you here today. Well, thank you so much, Terry. It's a pleasure to be back on this podcast and to get an opportunity to hang out with you again. Yeah. And for those of you who don't know, Sean and I also collaborate on a couple of different podcasts. So we're both on uh, Sean's podcast, which is the Compliance Guy Roundtable. We do a hashtag Terry Tuesday. You all know my CodeCast podcast. So it's fun to to get on the business side of medicine. We're going to have a little bit of a departure today. And our topic is healthcare and politics. I know some of you are like, uh oh. And shout out to one of our members, Adam Middleton, who listens to us while he jogs. And so he's going to be like, oh, this will be fun. But we are in an election year once again, and you cannot turn on a TV or get on social media without seeing some kind of commercial or mudslinging from the candidates. And it does seem that Medicare and HHS are always a topic of discussion, if not being attacked. So Sean and I are going to take a bit of a deep dive today in what to look for in this climate of politics and healthcare, what to be proactive in, and how to navigate through these political waters. So a lot to kind of talk about, really kind of take a look at. And Sean, I'm glad you're here to help me do it because you and I have had political discussions and we're going to try not to show our bias here because everyone has them. Everyone's one side or the other. And we, you know, whether we're conservative or on the other side, we have to talk about what the realities are when it comes to health care and politics. Absolutely. And, you know, here's what I would say, Terry. Um, you know, I, I, I when 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 you gave me the topic, you know, obviously the first thing that I thought in my mind was, well, how do you have a conversation about health care? without tying it directly to politics because it is such a politically charged issue because there's such a variety of complex factors that intertwine with broader political economic and social concerns right i mean we have economic impact and 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 i want to stay very apolitical right and that's one of the things that I, I tr- I've prided myself on over my, you know, now, you know, my career touches four decades, right? Even though it's 30 years, it's over four different decades. Mine so, is. you know, when we talk, yeah. So when we talk about, you know, the, politis- you know, the, the, the politicizing of healthcare, you can't avoid the reality that it impacts us right from an economic standpoint from an access and equity standpoint from ideological and moral view standpoints it impacts us from a public health and safety perspective and then of course you know it 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 hits us from the historical uh context and cultural aspects you know, you know, dating back to the 1960s, 
to the creation of the Medicare and Medicaid programs all the way through ACA, right? The Affordable Care Act, because these are things that leave lasting political legacies. And, and finally, you know, voter concerns and the electoral, you know, politics on how we deal with these things, you know, especially, you know, as it pertains to public opinion. So I, I, I'm, I'm really looking forward to our conversation. And, and, and of those six aspects that I mentioned, I'm happy to talk about any or all of those. But I think what I'll leave you with in this first part is given the factors that I've mentioned, you know, healthcare is a complex and contentious topic with obviously different stakeholders who advocate for diverse approaches based on their values, economic interests, and beliefs about the role of government and society and the high stakes, both in terms of personal impact on individuals' lives and broader economic implications ensure that healthcare will always be a deeply political issue, um, especially here in the United States. So uh, I'll pause and, and, and hopefully I've kind of, you know, uh, uh, gone in the direction that you were hoping, because again, um, you know, we, we want to talk about this openly and honestly without leaning right or left. You know, kind of, you know, taking that that um, that centrist, moderate view of healthcare. Yeah, I think the one thing that is is tough for me is yeah, there used to be this show on called West Wing, and it was um, it was a, it was based on on the Democratic opinion, but I thought it was very fair in showing both sides of things. And one of the things I remember that was being said by one of the characters is he said, and I'll quote, the beauty of the federal budget is that no one understands it. And to me, that's not the beauty, that's the detriment. <laughs> and when yeah. you look at that, I, I bring it into Medicare and again, politics, because it seems like instead of doing what's right, everyone's just trying to get elected or reelected. And so when you when you think of those in terms of it doesn't matter what size you're on, you know, the United States, in my opinion, has experienced or had experienced a pretty steady or period of, of low inflation from the late 90s through the COVID pandemic when you look at the big picture. But then COVID hit and we had not only supply chain disruption, but we had monetary policies, you know, just it, it just and ended up with record inflation over the next several years. But it exposed something that I think people didn't really understand when it came to and I, and I am going to focus on Medicare because we are looking at some really bad numbers coming up. And some people may not know this, but have an RN or became a nurse at some point, but my bachelor's degree is in economics. That was not my, my path was not healthcare. My path, I wanted to be CEO of Procter and Gamble. <laughs> so that's yeah. what I wanted to do as a kid. And so I, I took a left turn somewhere and got into healthcare, but it's, it's given me a unique understanding of budgets and costs and you know really looking at the i guess you call it the you know the, the economic index because one of the things that that people don't realize about the medicare system is there's something called budget neutrality adjustments and this is required when they created as sean said when you, they created the medicare program and then they came back to the ominous budget reconciliation act of 1989 any increase in Medicare over $20 million the to the physician payment fee schedule has to be offset by cuts elsewhere in the program. So when I, when I hear both candidates right now, and that's where we're, we get political saying, I'll, I'll never, you know, uh, they don't say I don't, I won't cut Medicare, I'll save Medicare, or I won't attack Medicare. They're, they're not being truthful because the 1.9% or 1.9 trillion relief package of 2021 by this current administration was pushed. Where, who's going to pay for that? You have to pay for it with tax dollars. And they're always like, oh, no, nobody will be taxed. Again, not truthful. And it's coming out of Medicare. They, cut, they find these agencies, these government plans that consistently make money. And so we're going to have an additional 4% reductions called the PAYGO, Pay As You Go Act. Um, that was pushed a couple of years. But now as of 2025, an additional 
4% is coming out of it, the fee schedule, which we're already looking at a 2.9% um, percent, 2.93 percent reduction. And Sean, you know, I'm sure your clients complain about this. But I know mine do. We still have a sequestration of 20 of 2 percent from the Obama years with the um, the when they raised the debt ceiling in 2013. And it's like they, they right. keep coming back to the Medicare program. And according to AMA, and I'm, I'm on their, white, their website right now, it says Medicare physician payment has dropped 22% adjusted for inflation between 2001 and 2021, and another 4% since this current administration's in office, 2021 to 2023, because of the requirement of that budget neutrality. And they keep adding services. They don't realize, and you and I probably to ad nauseum, where I've been talking about that complexity add on, now they give money to caregivers um, that have no clinical background. There's, you know, I, I appreciate the expansion of behavioral health, but there's certain things that they're saying we're going to pay for, and there's only one pie. There's only one pie, but, and, and, you know, obviously don't get me started on telehealth. And I think where it comes back to politics, and correct me if I'm wrong, is again, everyone's trying to get elected. So then they say, well, we're going to do this. And they don't realize how detrimental that is to Medicare and even Medicaid when they take money out of it that has nothing to do with health care. I'm with you, right? And, 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 and I agree with you across the board. Uh, you know, a, a lot of people may not know this, but I spent um, many, many years engaged with members of Congress um, in both the upper and lower chambers. And I worked across party lines, um, writing policy and engaging in a lot of different uh, areas where I had some general knowledge. And what I can tell you about politicians is they're politicians for a reason. And politicians do what is politically expedient rather than what is always right. And that's just politics, whether you're on the right, the left, or Somebody like Bernie Sanders, who claims to be uh, an independent when, you know, he <laughs> actually is a self-proclaimed socialist. But, you know, you, you brought up something really interesting, which is the consumer price index. And you started talking about um, inflation dating back to the 90s. And, and like you, you know, I have a background in economics. So I always enjoy when somebody wants to talk about um you know, how inflation works. And I think what people need to recognize is that during the 1990s, we had pretty stable inflation and it was moderate, right? Because it ranged anywhere from 1.6 to 3.4. And you can check my numbers if you want. Um, I, I like when people fact check me, but I, I think I'm pretty spot on that, that it, it ranged between 1.6 to 3.4. Um, you had a, a, a few years where it was a little bit higher, like in 1990, coming out of the 80s, where you were probably in the mid fives um, and you started to see the regression in 91 down into the fours. And then it kind of went down from there. But I think what people need to understand and recognize is inflation is controlled based on the U.S. economy, right? where you have stable economic growth, you have low unemployment, you have technological ad ad advances, um, which obviously contribute to moderate inflation. But more importantly, you have those at the helm of the Federal Reserve who create monetary policies that are focused on controlling inflation. And that's what plays a significant role in maintaining price stability during the 90s and then you come into the 2000s right and you had a varied annual um um inflation rate which was influenced by a lot of economic events that transpired especially in 2009 what they referred to as the great recession um where it was a complete deflation of our economy Right. You had monetary policies that were changing. We had a lot of global flat, uh, uh, global factors impacting us um, during the 2000s all the way through, you know, 2020. So, uh, again, you know, for me, what I want to see from a politician, and I think it's really, really important that people understand this point. 
the president of the United States does not unilaterally cut taxes. The president of the United States does not unilaterally control spending. Taxation and 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 spending is done by Congress. It's a legislative process. So a president may have influence over the House and or the Senate if they are of the same party. So if you have a a Democratic president and you have a Democratic Congress, right, House and Senate, the president, if they're in lockstep, as long as the person's not an absolute wackadoodle, they could be in lockstep or vice versa. Maybe you have members in Congress who are absolutely out of their minds and they want Medicare for all and they want ridiculous out of control spending, you know, infrastructure and all these social reform programs, which don't get me wrong, they're important, but we've got to prioritize. And for me, one of the things that I've been most shocked about in this election cycle at first, where it was. Um, the current resident of the White House, uh, Joe Biden, going up against the former president, Donald Trump, where there was no discussion about health care or it was minimal, which was shocking to me because we still have ACA, right? We now have the Democratic nominee. Kamala Harris. What's tough is that yeah. she hasn't been vetted. We don't know what her policy stance is. If she, if she's linking herself to Joe Biden, we do. And 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 it's what the unfortunately, I, and I'm not trying to be part, you know, partisan you guys here, but you know, saying to our listeners, but it's the mess we're in now. I mean, think about it. Well, she has to be linked to Joe Biden because this was the Biden Harris ticket. I know. I yeah. know. But when we look at these cuts into Medicare, there is a there's a risk here that you know long term long term stability of a physician practice is to me kind of sitting on a fence because once these redistributions are made through the conversion factor and not added back even when utilization is lower than expected the net result in these circumstances is really not budget budget neutrality it's permanent reduction in the Medicare physician payments across the board because remember. With the, in the proposed rule that we current have with these with this almost three percent reduction again, what it, what happens is that it shift codes around for you know budget neutrality. Right. So increases he, he, in one place, but then all the across the board, they have to decrease to pay for the extra things they do. And also remember to our listeners, budget neutrality does not apply for hospitals, nursing facilities, hospice care, ambulatory surgery centers. They get mandated updates. This is for physician fee schedules, which is what Sean and I primarily work in. And this imbalance has resulted in spending per enrollee for other parts of Medicare. And that's increasing over the last decade. They said from 3.6% to 42%. Even as spending on physician services has dropped per enrollee by 1%. So, and, and this is coming right from the AMA. This comes right from the, you know, the, the OMB website. It, it's, it's so sad to me to see the decline. And let's say that um, either candidate is saying, we're not going to attack Medicare. We're going to keep it the way it is. That's not good enough. We have to fix the problem with Medicare right now because if, you know, as, as a somebody who, who, you know, has an economic background like you as well, you know, we've done the math and currently our fee schedule and our conversion factor, which is the multiplier we use that we go to um, multiply against the value that has been put in place by the code. And right now it's 32.74, again, going down by almost 3% for, for next year. The, the problem that we have here is that this fee schedule is similar given inflation to what we had in 1972 that can't be sustained and pretty soon it seems like the doctors are going to be paying medicare to see their patients now i realize they're trying to get all medicare advantage by 2030 and that's not even a good idea because we know how they're being you know looked at and where does value-based care come in when they're trying to deal with that it it seems like you know what it reminds me of sean it reminds me of AI where it was rolled out before it was ready and it seems like Medicare has had so much and I don't even want to call it growth but so many twists and turns and, ch and changes into what the original premise was 
and why it was recreated to begin with that it, it, it seems like it's kind of like social security. Social security was supposed to be for the elderly. Well, now it plays, pays also disabled people. Now we're hearing that certain um, non undocumented people are now getting checks. They're, and it's expanding to the point where it's going to be drained. And Medicare, we can't do that. The Medicare seniors depend on that. We pay into that. You know, they pay into that. And I, it makes me very nervous in this political climate. And for those of you, the biggest takeaway, I would think, and hopefully, Sean, you agree, when you see those proposals come out and there is a proposed budget, go to cms.gov and you can even go to their newsroom and there's a, the link on there. It's for 90 days and it says you can comment. Now, do they ever do anything with the comments? They do actually take them into consideration. I haven't seen much change, but they do take your comments into consideration. But they say that we only get comments from physicians about 2% in the country. That's not enough. That's not enough. It's kind of like when somebody complains about the state of the country and they don't vote. You, you have to participate to be able to say, I don't want this, or I want this, or this is what needs to change. And you really need to partic participate in the process. I worry um, when it comes to what people talk about with Social Security. Uh, I don't think anybody should at this point um rely on the fact that they're going to collect social security um when they retire uh it it, it just it, it just the current situation that we're in it's just not sustainable i'm i'm trying to I'm I'm trying to find the most apolitical way to say this. Um and and it's just so hard. It is. Uh I think you know when when we when we look at the potential for solvency of the social security system, right? Um it, it, there's no doubt that we continue to face significant changes, right? Because the old age and survivor's insurance, it's called um, uh, OASI, and it's a trust fund, is projected to be um, depleted in its reserves by 2033, uh, while the disability insurance trust fund is expected to remain solvent possibly for 75 years. But if no changes are made, the combined Social Security trust fund will become insolvent by 2035. That's what I read too. Which means 11 years. Benefit cuts yeah. are coming. Yeah. Benefit cuts are coming. And the long term shortfall is largely driven by the aging population with costs rising faster than revenue. So it goes back to the discussion that people just don't want to have on certain sides, which is the inflation rate. When inflation outpaces revenues, it becomes an unsustainable model. Yeah. And that's where we're at. That's where so, we're at. you know, how does it tie back into healthcare? I, I think I go back to the original, you know, conversation that we started having, which is, you know, in, in my humble opinion, there are six areas that I outlined where I believe, you know, Healthcare has to be looked at and we've got to look at it from an economic standpoint. We've got to look at it from a social uh, standpoint. We've got to look at it from a quality of care standpoint. We've got to look at it from a holistic standpoint to be able to understand where we've been to where we're going and to find ways other than cutting physician reimbursement to make the programs remain solvent. Um, I don't I don't anticipate Medicare being around when I'm ready for it. And and that's yeah. in and that's in, you know, 50, uh, what am I? I'm 50. So you could take Medicare at 65. So 15 years from now, I'm not expecting Medicare to be around. So, you know, am, am I, you know, am I sticking money into certain things like Bitcoin? Yeah. Am I hiding money under my mattress? Probably, <laughs> um, but, but, you know, am I am I 
buying investments and commodities like gold and silver and stuff like that? Sure. But, you know, what is the landscape going to look like? And, you know, with I think this is the other key factor, Terry, that one of the reasons why I love being a member of NSCHBC is the diversity of the organization with it being made up of attorneys, CPAs, um, business professionals, healthcare consultants. Um, it, it's just an incredible melting pot of knowledge and professionals. And it, it allows us to be able to have this kind of a discussion without it turning into, well, you're, you're a Republican or you're a Democrat. No, I'm an American first and foremost concerned about the current state of our Republic and where it's going for the future. Right. And just to kind of wrap this up too, the, the biggest takeaway I just really yeah. want to give to our listeners is that you can't stand by and wait to see what happens. You need to participate in the process. You need to make sure you are contacting Congress. You're contacting your associations. They're your lobbying effort that you are commenting and reading through those proposed rules on your fee schedule. You can't have one of your staff member, you know, come to you and say, oh, they're looking at another 3% cut. You roll your eyes and go back to work. You can't do that. You need to yeah. go through, sit down, yeah. read it, even sit with a consultant, get the, if, if you just want the, the cliff notes and basically say, okay, where do I, you know, comment? And it's important because we need not just primary care doctors, we need specialty physicians, surgeons. We need all of you to, to really step it up this year. Otherwise it's, it's just not going to be fixed and it needs, it needs a fix, not a band aid. Not, you know, um, our politicians bloviating that they they won't touch Medicare. That's what I was looking for. They're saying we won't touch Medicare. It needs to be touched. It needs to be fixed. It needs to be funded. And it needs to they need to stop touching it for, you know, um, their packages of tax, whatever they want to call it. Go to, you know, they, there's so much and they call it pork. There's so much things that the budget, you know, pays for that they could go attack something else. If anyone has ever uh, seen the movie Dave, you need to go watch it. It's pretty funny. It's just supplanting someone who looks like the, the president because he had a, a medical emergency pretending to be the president. And then he has to go in and try and cut the budget. And he comes in with, you know, this his his accountant from his real job. And he goes, God, if I ran my my uh, checkbook this way, I'd be out of business in two minutes. And we're like, we know. <laughs> so, you know, just look and see, you know, some of the things that they pay for, you know, they pay for funding to see if you like the car that you have. They, you know, they're just little stupid stuff that they could be attacking. And, and yes, I am getting a little more political now, but I, I just felt like there there needed to be a little bit of a rant, a little bit of a conversation. And we have never done healthcare and politics. And I think it's important because unfortunately they're intertwined your your politicians are there to get votes you're there to get paid for what you do and to treat your patients and if you if you don't pay attention if you don't participate if you don't have a voice you won't be getting paid any longer and our and you your access your seniors access to care is not going to be there so well we'd like to thank sean for being our guest on the podcast today sean thank you very much for being here it's my pleasure always enjoyable to find it and contact Sean, you can go to the NSCHBC website at nschbc.org and click on Find a Consultant. Type in his first name, Sean, S-E-A-N, and his information will appear. You can also go to doctorsmanagement.org and that, is it .org or .com? It's actually doctors-management.com. Okay, and you will find Sean's information. Also, as a reminder, nschbc.org website offers monthly free webinars on a variety of topics, as well as quarterly Medicare regulatory updates. Please go to nschbc.org and click on the tab Upcoming Education. We have a variety of topics for 2024 that you don't want to miss. Our next Medicare third quarter update webinar is Tuesday, September 21st at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. I am the speaker for that. Again, go to nschbc.org to register. That's it for us today, everyone. Make it a great day, a great rest of your month, and thank you for listening to the award-winning NSCHBC Edge podcast. I'm your host, Terry Fletcher. Thank you for listening to the NSCHBC Edge podcast. 
Join us on the second Tuesday of each month as our consultants tackle the complexities of navigating the business of medicine. You can reach us on the web at nschbc.org, the National Society of Certified Healthcare Business Consultants.